Good morning, everyone. Apologize for being so late, but as you know, you are in Portugal. No, I'm kidding. We had, we had, been, we had some troubles trying to, to connect with Surya Monroe, um, and we, we managed to, to have an alternative uh, way to present the uh, presentation. So welcome to the first plenary session of this day, of this second day of the Intimate Queering Friendship Conference. Um, I must say that the presentations of these sessions, uh, they result from a special issue entitled Trans Policy and Practice uh, from the Critical Social Policy Journal. And we are starting with, this, with a paper co-authored with Soraya Monroe and Judith Takas. I don't know if that's right. Um, and Ana Cristina Santos, she's going to read uh, Soraya's, pa Soraya's papers. Good morning. So please bear with me. I haven't read uh, Soraya's notes uh, in advance because this was our c contingency plan. So yeah, we'll manage. This paper, like the others in the panel, came about primarily through a workshop on trans issues in Europe, funded by the European Social Research Fund. And we'd like to thank our colleagues who made this possible, and of course the funders. However, we also wish to thank the Fundamental Rights Agency, who funded the huge study on which we drew for this paper. It was a survey across 19 EU member states about the role of public officials in supporting LGBT people, which many officials and researchers contributed to. Monroe and other colleagues from the University of Othersfield were commissioned to write the final report. And of course, the trans activists and others who contributed to both studies. There appears to be a perception amongst policymakers that trans people are not really worth bothering with, as this slide shows. Trans people in the 14 countries in the study are supported by international human rights frameworks and the EU legislation is supposed to guarantee equal treatment. However, transposition of the EU law varies across EU member states, including post-socialist ones. For example, in Croatia, which has a range of trans-positive legislation. But overall, none of the examined countries provide full rights for trans people, as this table shows. Many of you will be very familiar with citizenship studies. Our paper starts by outlining some basics, such as the way that trans citizenship studies built on the earlier work of feminist and sexual citizenship scholars, such as Diane Richardson. We mentioned gender pluralism, where gender is seen as a spectrum, not a rigid binary, and the usefulness for this for trans citizenship. We then bring in the universalism, particularism debate. Universalist citizenship is about the way in which certain rights frameworks and claims to citizenship can be relevant to everyone, such as the right to freedom from harassment, for example. Particularist approaches addresses the claims and issues of specific groups, and they can be useful for highlighting the citizenship of diverse trans people. We use both approaches in this paper. We also note the specific dynamics of post-socialist countries, including changing gender and sexuality, re sexuality regimes in relation to the legacy of Soviet rule. You can see here that we drew on two distinct studies both used purposive sampling and thematic analysis. The first study was conducted by author one and author two in 2015, involved semi-structured interviews with altogether 10 trans activists, including six participants identifying themselves as trans, allies and or experts in trans issues from the following countries. Bosnia Herzegovina, Belarus, Hungary, Kyrgyzstan, okay, thank you. Lithuania, <laughs> Poland, Russia, Serbia, Slovakia and, Slovakia, and Slovenia. The second study was conducted by the Fundamental Rights Agency with support from Author 3 and Author 3's team. <laughs> <laughs> and it included the following countries Bulgaria, Croatia, Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Romania, and Slovakia. 17 of the 310 professionals and policymakers within an LGBT remit 
who were interviewed in these countries had a specific role concerning trans healthcare, and it is these interviews which are the main source here. Some progress has been made in gaining legal citizenship in some of the countries, but there is an absence of the most ba basic rights in some countries, as this quote shows. The situation varies considerably. For example, in Poland, there is no specific law about gender recognition, only high court rulings. It was decided, and it, she's quoting, it was decided that in these cases, your parents would be the ones who are responsible for giving you a legal gender, and then they would be the ones who to decide in that legal argument. This is a quote from a trans activist and researcher in Poland. The barriers to trans citizenship in post-socialist countries, as in many others, include a lack of awareness about trans citizenship issues at both national and more local and frontline levels. Public officials often felt that the social climate is unsupportive of trans citizenship related work. The barriers to transpositive citizenship interventions include prejudice founded on religious belief and or traditionalism regarding gender and sexuality, and a lack of real levers to ensure that citizenship directives are implemented within EU countries. However, the Fundamental Rights Agency study from 2016 shows overall that EU directives and recommendations provide a framework for trans citizenship in the post-socialist EU succession countries. The Fundamental Rights Agency research outlined substantial support for trans health-related citizenship across the EU, including in post-socialist EU countries. Developments are underpinned by standards such as the Universalist Council of Europe recommendation from 2010, and these are having impact on the ground in some places. There were also indications that a handful of proactive practitioners are taking very diversity-inclusive approaches, exceeding trans-citizenship situations in most other EU countries. For example, a Hungarian private in vitro clinic helped a trans couple to have children. However, there are difficulties, for example, inconsistencies in Romania law mean that most surgeons refuse to perform, perform gender reassignment surgeries because they could be held cr criminally responsible for reproductive failure in their patients. Poor practice and overt prejudice towards trans people were evident in some places. Resource constraints on care provision were a major issue in some countries, but this varied. Monopolies on care provision existed in some countries, for example, uh, Belarus, and there is only one available psychiatrist, the head of the sexology department of the Minsk City Neuropsychiatry Clinic, who publicly expressed a very homophobic views, and according to our respondents, believe that, and she's quoting, it is possible to prevent transsexuality if the person grows up in an intact family with the right relations, end of quote. The situation was shaped by the post-socialist context in very, various ways, including the positive effects of greater social openness and support for diversity, for example, in Slovakia. Things are also affected by broader social political changes, as this slide shows. So we found that trans people exercise agency in many ways in post-socialist countries, but also that there is severe discrimination in some of them and the lack of comprehensive citizenship rights in general. Some patterns are particularly marked in this set of countries, and these patterns are resource constraints, monopolies in healthcare provision, and inconsistencies in medical legal provision. At the universalist level, EU directives are important in supporting trans citizenship and they are having a positive impact in the EU countries. However, they are far from being universally implemented and are often dependent on the goodwill of professionals and civic servants. Outside of the EU, there is even greater reliance on proactive healthcare and legal professionals to meet trans people's citizenship rights indicating a need for particular list analysis that addresses national and supranational contexts. There are specificities concerning trans citizenship in these countries, which may or may not be replicated elsewhere. Some of these are discussed above, including the level of inconsistencies in medical legal situations. 
Trans communities are increasingly faced with the organized resistance against gender equality and sexual citizenship in Europe in a form of so-called anti-gender movements, which are activist networks and lobbies that support traditional sexist and homophobic norms and that often have close connections to the Catholic Church. These mobilizations are based on intentionally malformed interpretations of post-structuralist understandings of gender. From a citizenship perspective, traditionalist, masculinist and heterosexist models of citizenship are being deployed in some post-socialist countries in a highly restrictive way, excluding trans people from models of a good citizen. Overall, our article points to a need for legal and healthcare citizenship to be foregrounded with respect to trans people in post-socialist countries. The references are all in the paper. Thank you for listening. Any questions, please contact when one of us them. <laughs> Thank you, Anna Christina, for reading Surya's um, paper. Uh, now we're going to hear Sally Hines with the presentation co-author with Anna Christina Santos. Okay, hi everyone. Thank you for being here this morning. Sorry about all the chaos. Um, so this is um, the paper that I wrote um, with Anna Christina Santos, I'm just used to saying Christina, um, for the special issue. Um, and it was called Trans Policy, Politics and Research, the UK um, and Portugal. So what we tried to do then in this article was to explore law and social policy regarding trans activism um, and non-binary social movements and academic research um, in the UK and in Portugal. Um, we sought to consider different possibilities for theorising gender diversity. And what we tried to do um, in relation to, to kind of moving theory on was to combine um, the notion of um, embodied citizenship um, with a politics of difference. And so we consider then in this paper recent law and policy shifts around gender recognition in both the UK and in Portugal. And we examine the gaps and the connections between policy developments, activism, and also academic research around trans. Though each country has divergence in terms of the history of trans activism and research, um, what we did was to identify significant similarities um, in the claims of activist groups in both countries. Um, and we, we found that the issues and questions under consideration in academic research on trans and non-binary um, were very similar. So the overlaps and the gaps between academia, social policy and politics, we found, offer a prolific field for inquiry on topics as diverse as academic impact, public sociology and the links between academia and social movements. In this article, we considered trans as a mobilising theme in law and social policy on the one hand and academia on the other. Our understanding of trans in this article includes both trans people who wish to be part of the binary system of male and female and people who do not. Um, we support the view throughout the paper that trans policy, politics and research must enable room for a range of gender-based identities, including gender fluidity and non-binary. Okay. So just to talk a little bit then about our kind of theoretical um, approach, um, beginning then with citizenship. So the notion of citizenship has long been at the core of theoretical contributions and political concerns regarding vulnerable subject positions. The construction of citizens as those who are able to participate publicly in decisions that affect their lives and to make claims which are heard and recognised brought light new layers of exclusion as well as new opportunities to frame citizenship beyond a narrow understanding of strictly social and political formal rights. So from the 1990s onwards, drawing heavily on contributions from feminist and queer academics and inspired by developments advanced by social movements in Europe and North America, sexuality started to be required, regarded as a crucial element then of citizenship. And I'm thinking here of work by um, Diane Richardson, as Surya mentioned in her paper, um, Ken Plummer and Geoffrey Weeks. 
In relation to formal recognition, issues such as access to partnering and parenting rights, including marriage, civil partnership and adoption, are quite centre stage in struggles around equality policies and sexual freedoms. So kind of concepts such as um, intimate citizenship from Ken Plummer, um, the sexual citizen from um, Bell and Binney Weeks and Diane Richardson became increasingly pop popular, grounded as they already were in the daily experiences of people living and loving beyond what Sasha Rose Neal called the heteronorm. So more recently, topics such as medically assisted conception or surrogacy and fierce debates around abortion across the globe have contributed to studies on reproductive citizenship, intimate and sexual um, and reproductive citizenship then, offer productive tools to theorise gender diversity. In both the UK and in Portugal, the autonomy in determining one's identity through self-identification has been a consistent mobilising topic for claims and actions against the power ascribed to the medical field. In the UK, such resistance has been framed under the umbrella of human rights, whereas in Portugal, demands have clustered more around citizenship, equality and social justice. Common to both contexts, though, is the emphasis on depathologisation as a way to reclaim autonomy over one's body and identities whilst at the same time rejecting the centrality of psychiatry in trans-related processes. In this regard, then, we as authors um, advance the notion of trans-embodied citizenship as a way to acknowledge the importance of lived experience and self-determination regarding trans claims and identities. Embodied citizenship is different from bodily citizenship in the sense that it does not take bodily integrity or bodily modification as the core for demands around recognition. On the contrary, trans-embodied citizenship, we would argue, um, invites us to look beyond the body in its strict sense, while at the same time retaining the legitimacy of lived experience, of bodily autonomy, of overcoming obstacles to full access of citizenship, by embracing rights as non-negotiable common ground. However, the notion of citizenship is frequently interlinked with the politics of recognition, which attempts to reshape social justice on the basis of reinstating recognition that has been previously denied. Theories of politics of recognition emerged in the 1990s again and were interlinked with the politics of social movements centered on the identities of race, class, gender and sexuality. From this premise, social justice is not possible without recognition. Theories of recognition, though, have been subject to critique. So um, Cressida Hayes, um, Louis McNay, and also myself um, have argued that recognition theory presumes a fixed self. So to quote, um, certain features of a person lie dormant awaiting discovery by the individual who then presents this authentic self to the world and, de and demands positive recognition for it. Um, critiques then suggest that recognition theory often assumes a fixed group identity um, as well um, as a fixed individual identity. While this might work in favour of those deemed to fit the characteristics of a particular identity, those who project alternative identity markers are positioned outside of collective identities. Debates around the place of trans women within feminism at the moment are a pertinent example of this. So in this way, my work um, has drawn out the ways in which politics of recognition can work to exclude trans people from LGB and feminist movements. A politics of recognition is therefore problematic, we argue, um, for theorising gender diversity, as it may contribute to the construction um, and replication of identity-based narratives around authenticity or gendered realness. This is especially problematic from a queer lens that is attuned to the myriad of non-binary ways through which gender becomes daily enacted and structurally silenced. A framework of recognition then not only bears down on everyday life experiences through practices of exclusion, but as we're going to look at in the paper, impacts on how trans-related law and policy um, are, de are designed and implicated. 
Thus, pro-trans laws and social policy often remain focused on binary conceptualizations of the body, disregarding the nuances through which trans lived experiences and embodiment are managed and negotiated in the everyday. Somewhat paradoxically then, gender fluidity becomes further silenced through legal and social policies around trans that reproduces traditional frameworks that foreground authentic binary genders. So in our two geographical contexts, um, we argue that gender authenticity is a much contested terrain. So, you know, gender realness was found um, to be really important in both the Portuguese and the UK setting. In advancing the notion of trans embodied citizenship to enable self recognition of a diversity of gendered identities and bodily states, then we conceptualize citizenship as distinct from a politics um, of recognition. A politics of difference provides another productive framework through which to theorise gender diversity. This approach hones in on the distinct structural positions, embodied experiences and identity claims amongst members within a minority movement, alongside theorising these distinctions in relation to wider society. In contrast to calls for assimilationism, difference from this perspective is celebrated and understood as offering productive potentials through which to form political alliances. We suggest that this offers a more fruitful framework through which to account for gender diversity without slipping back into the debates about who is the most or less authentically gendered. How am I doing for time? Five more minutes. Okay, so that's our theoretical framework. So in five minutes, I will tell you what we found um, in the paper. Okay, so trans policy then within a UK context um, very much focuses on the Gender Recognition Act. Okay, so the UK Gender Recognition Act enabled trans people um, to change their birth certificates um, and to marry in their required um, gender. Um, it was considered to be a really important um, legislation, piece of legislation at the time, um, giving those citizenship rights um, for the first time um, for trans people. Um, I'll just say really quickly that the, um, that the Gender Recognition Act in the UK is currently under review. Um, there's a government consultation happening at the moment um, and what that consultation is doing um, is seeking to ask how the Gender Recognition Act might be um, reframed um, in order to provide better um, and, and kind of fuller rights for all trans people. Um, and so this could include, um, for example, rights and recognition for non-binary people and also for younger trans people. Just um, a quick call that that closes, the consultation closes at 11 o'clock on Friday morning. So if you haven't filled in the consultation document, please do so. Um, if you're from the UK, it really, really matters. And it really matters that um, allies and cis people fill it in and don't just leave trans rights to trans people. Anyway, um, so what the report did then, um, the Gender Recognition <coughs> Report, um, set out rights which have, have been found to be wanting um, and they're under consultation um, in the UK. Key to, the, to this is a depathologization um, of gender. So a move away from kind of medical intervention, um, which was also found to be a key um, point um, on trans policy within a Portuguese context. So both, um, both social movements then um, and policy in both um, Portugal and the UK centered very much um, on kind of debates around and move towards um, moving trans rights away from a medical um, perspective, but also from a kind of a medical professional practice. Researching trans in the UK and Portugal. So we found then that there were lots of similarities um, between research academic research um, in the UK and Portugal around trans. Um, so empirical research on trans in the UK then 
has in the main been produced by social sciences and has connected closely with the social, cultural, legal and policy shifts. So in many ways, um, what, what social science has done in the UK um, is, is to kind of trace those policy shifts um, and kind of, from through a sociological lens, look at the meanings and the significance of what's happening kind of within the policy landscape in relation to citizenship, rights and recognition. So there's been different kind of approaches um, in the UK. Um, early work such as that by Richard Eakins and Dave King um, worked to importantly challenge a universal um, understanding of trans. So that early work then kind of um, pointed to the diversity within trans communities. Um, Surya Monroe's work um, looked at gender pluralism again to kind of counter an undifferentiated model um, of trans. Stephen Whittle's intervention um, was really important in problematizing a kind of wholly deconstructive um, analysis and pointing to lived experience. Um, this has been taken up by sociologists, so for example my work has looked at a kind of lived experience and material realities um, so as Zoe's work in terms of kind of healthcare um, and practice um, and Tam Sandra's work has looked at kind of embodiment um, and the family. So kind of a central theme there then um, has been kind of lived experience, personal life, um, emotional life and also the importance um, of health. In Portugal um, we found a very, um, a very similar um, kind of area. Um, the difference, I think, was that Portugal um, was, was kind of more interdisciplinary, so studies on trans were spread across um, a greater diversity of disciplines, and with quite a lot of kind of studies coming from psychology, yeah. Um, but still, you know, within kind of social, sociological and kind of political studies, we found very much um, that the work centred on, on kind of um, the, the lived experiences of the claims of social movements. So work kind of within, um, within politics, within social movements, um, and within kind of law um, and policy was very much kind of connected to the work um, being done um, by, by kind of scholars and what they were doing in the same way as in the UK um, was looking at, at kind of how people lived through those kind of policy shifts, lived through those changes and, and kind of um, wanted to get a kind of a more grounded understanding um, of, of kind of the, the voices of, of the people involved in the social movements. Okay, I'm going to finish. We found very many similarities, um, some differences, but mostly um, we found that, that trans studies is, is really kind of, you know, alive and well um, in both countries. Um, it's an established and establishing field um, and, and kind of policy shifts are, we suggest, moving in the right direction. But don't forget to consult on the GRA. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sally. Now we are giving floor to Judith van Schulenberg. So, um, hi everyone, my name is Judith van Schulenberg. Um, I'm from Belgium, by the way, not from the Netherlands, it was in the program. But um, I'm going to talk about discourses of agency and care in Latin American transgender women in sex work. Um, for the um, special issue of critical social policy, um, I did um, a critical review on um, 10 years of research on transgender and non-binary persons and sexual risk uh, from a feminist intersectional perspective, and um, this is uh, the base, basis for my, uh, for my talk today. Um, and uh, for the, this paper, I reviewed current research on transgender sexual health. Um, 2005 to 2015. Um, so, um, first of all, what I found was that um, all of this research had a highly selective focus on HIV and sex work. Um, HIV rates were ver rated very high, um, 
and that uh, research was all, only focusing on transgender women and mostly stemmed from North America um, and large urban areas like New York and San Francisco and um, Asian uh, populations. But uh, and these rates were generalized frequently, which is highly problematic because um, social contexts for transgender persons as for sex workers um, are very different over, um, the, all over the world. And there are actually almost no uh, European studies. Um, today there are some, I, uh, I think, but um, like the prevalence rates for Europe completely lack. And um, the, this research was also very binary, very heteronormative and cisnormative, um, assuming standard uh, male and female bodies, and uh, especially focusing on transgender women in a heterosexual relationship with a cisgender man having anal sex, so, um, which, which was considered high-risk behavior. Um, but what is acknowledged in uh, every study almost is uh, the role of discrimination in um, this high risk of HIV. Uh, but what I argue in this paper, oh, sorry. <laughs> so what I argue in the paper is that um, there is no intersectional perspective and um, there's uh, the other uh, intersection, intersecting social positions are not uh, taken, taken into account. Uh, because it, it's um, and uh, one area where this is uh, apparent is transgender sex work, um, which is um, estimated high, a high involvement in sex work for especially transgender women, uh, than for uh, cisgender um, women, and um, this is almost uh, mo it almost always attributed to discrimination on the labor market which leads to uh, economic marginalization and uh, this forces transgender uh, women in sex work in order to survive. This is the uh, main discourse. Um, so for today, I wanted to add uh, a critique to uh, my initial review uh, in critical social policy that I only realized myself when I was uh, conducting research on transgender sex work myself. And um, that is that um, all this research on transgender sex work, um, the, co the concept of agency is completely absent because um, transgender sex workers are always seen as an extremely vulnerable high-risk group because of this discrimination. And by only focusing on uh, this, the this, this discrimination aspect, um, the studies do not take into account the transgender sex workers' agency and um, uh, for this reason I wanted to shift uh, focus from the victimization perspective to these discourses of agency voiced by transgender women in sex work. Um, so um, we conducted research on transgender women in sex work ourselves. Um, we did a study with face-to-face um, -face survey questionnaires um, with transgender sex workers in collaboration with uh, two outreach uh, organizations. Um, and um, we later added nine uh, in-depth interviews with transgender women um, working in the Antwerp red light district. So it's, it's only the red light district, district area in Antwerp and you have um, a large area of window-based um, sex work there. And um, there's uh, a street that is um, particularly uh, filled with transgender sex workers. So they are quite um, visible there. Of course, this is only one um, form of sex work. Eh? Um, but so the transgender women in the um, Antwerp Red Light District were all um, transgender persons on the female spectrum. Um, they were slightly older than the uh, main population in the, um, the Antwerp uh, Red Light District, uh, cisgender sex workers. They were all between 40 and 60, and 75% um, was from Latin American descent. Yeah, the, um, the chart is in Dutch, sorry. But uh, you can see that almost uh, more than 60% was from Ecuador, and um, a lot of them had the Spanish uh, nationality. So um, in the in-depth interviews, we went uh, looking at migration pathways, 
uh, because we assumed that there would be a migration path from Ecuador over Spain to the Western European uh, sex industry. But um, as you can see, um, the persons we interviewed, their uh, migration paths, um, they vary uh, a lot. So um, we have seven persons from Ecuador, but they, their first destination countries are uh, France, Germany, um, uh, Italy, uh, the Netherlands, and uh, then they, they further migrate to, migrate to Spain, um, and um, most of the times they um, cite the economic crisis uh, in Spain for moving uh, further to Western Europe. And um, I want, for the rest of my uh, talk, I'm going to focus on the um, Latin American sex workers because they uh, consist the the majority of the population of transgender sex workers in um, Antwerp. Um, so we went looking to their migration objectives, and they were first of all economic. So um, in this regard. Transgender women uh, are not that different from other migrants. They are they often come from poor uh, backgrounds and they want to escape this. Um, they are really in search of a better life. But um, these economic objectives are uh, frequently interwoven with emancipatory um, objectives um, because many of them cite non-acceptance by their families and. Um, um, and narratives of discrimination and violence in their home country. And uh, migration to Europe is then uh, an opportunity to become them themselves. So um, when we looked at the um, objectives for engaging in sex work, we see that they were also primary economic, but um, when we looked for further in these objectives, we also um, heard a lot of uh, persons talk about the pleasure aspect, that they actually also liked being in sex work, um, that they see it as like another job. Um, and um, this was something that returned a lot in the interviews. Um, and we, some studies have suggested that uh, sex work can be an affirmation of uh, the gender identity because you can um, portray a very um, stereotypical feminine role um, doing sex work. And this, is, this was something that was not at all voiced by the transgender women we interviewed. Um, like Carmen, for instance, she uh, voices that the work instead makes her feel more like a man because she frequently has to take on the uh, male gender role during uh, sex work. Uh, clients often ask these transgender women uh, that mostly still have uh, their penis to penetrate them and she states that it is not the work itself that makes her feel more like a, uh, a woman, but the money that she gets from, the, from sex work makes her feel like a woman because she can pay the hormones and, um, and indeed a lot of them um, um, also say they uh, use sex work to save up for gender affirming surgeries or facial feminization. Um, but um, three of the, of the transgender women um, that we interviewed had a, a partner here in uh, Antwerp and um, they, they also cite not having to work because their partner provides for them and actually they do, don't, do not have to work but they all three said they wanted to keep doing the work to be able to be uh, independent and um, they frequently voiced um, plans for the future like um, that, you, that you wanted to invest in housing in Ecuador to move back there and um, to, ha to have a, a life there later in life. Um, and um, so they, they really had, were thinking about the future a lot. And um, a lot of them um, also invested in, they, a lot of them actually had multiple houses in Ecuador. And um, they also bought houses in Ecuador for, uh, to provide for their families. So um, this actually brings me to the discourses of care because um, what I found striking was that um, 
a lot of them had voiced that they were not accepted um, for their gender identity when they left their home uh, for Europe. So this was a, a really big reason to uh, migrate. Um, but they do still have close contact to their uh, families and they uh, provide for them by buying houses and some of them also cited, um, cited uh, finance, financing education for their siblings. Um, so we see that most of, most of them were like multiple years, like 10 or 20 years in Europe and they still keep this uh, connection to their family. Uh, like Carmen for instance, she uh, financially supports um, her mother and her three brothers in Ecuador and actually she says my whole family relies on me uh, in Ecuador. And um, what I found particularly interesting was that um, I also interviewed one um, transgender sex worker uh, from Belgium and she, um, she also had like this story about um, my family did not accept me and I broke off all bonds so I moved 10 kilometers further. further. So the, the, the Ecuadorian women, they also moved like overseas and they still keep that connection. Um, and this will also, I found this to be in contrast of like the um, friendship bonds between the trans, uh, transgender sex workers that were also mainly absent, I, I, I found. And there was really no, um, among them, no sense of community connectedness. Um, this really lacked in their discourses. And um, they were often really mean about each other, I, I thought. And um, they were also frequently voicing like some sort of distinction, like I'm not like the rest of the transgender sex worker community. So I thought this was really interesting. And um, what I wanted to, um, of course, I'm still, um, analyzing this data and uh, this research is still ongoing so we, I think we should an analyze this um, more deeply. But uh, what I wanted to show uh, with this was that uh, first and foremost motives for sex work are uh, for transgender women are complex, they are varied and they go beyond the stereotype of the sex worker that has to rely on sex work in order to survive. And they are also depending on these intersectional positions of migration status, ethnicity, origin, citizenship status. And um, when we study these topics, we should um, take these, discu these discourses of agency in account um, and not only focus on this discrimination aspect, because of, although discrimination is a um, really important factor in the engagement of sex work, uh, for transgender persons, we should really step away from this um, stereotype of the transgender victim that um, has to rely on sex work to survive, even if um, they have a vulnerable uh, position in society. So, um, this was my presentation, what I wanted to do. Thank you. Now, we're going to hear... Jenik van der Ross. Thank you for inviting us. I'm a bit nervous because we are not talking about intimate friendships at all. So it's kind of what am I doing here, <clears throat> which is a philosophical question too. But um, at least what I'm going to talk about is that uh, it's about the Norwegian state's regulation of intimate relations and intimate issues, gender identity being a rather intimate issue and the state is um, regulating that. <coughs> Besides this, uh, <coughs> we, the issue, the special issue, is the, res is the result of networking of uh, trans studies scholars who became friends. So, so academic friendship and, very, and intimate friendships is a part of it. So I think it's okay that we are here. <coughs> I'm a political scientist, so I'm taking a political science um, uh, approach to it, and um, uh, contrary maybe to, to uh, Sally, I am very fond of the <coughs> recognition theory, and <laughs> so, so I'm going to work, work with that. Trying to understand or to, to uh, present for you the, um, what trans, transgender citizenship in Norway 
is and has developed to and uh, where it is um, successful and where it is failing because there are we have uh, successes and we have uh, huge failures which I think we can understand by using the concepts of recognition if we introduce both mal recognition and non recognition here we go so <coughs> the the um, Presentation is based on our article in the, this um, special issue, Transgen Trans and Gender Variant Citizenship and the State of Norway, where uh, my co-author, Syria Manro, who we didn't get on Skype this morning, as we tried, but <coughs> she is with us. Um, we try to demonstrate the contrast between um, the citizenship statuses of transsexual men and women who often are present themselves as gender corrected women and men, the good citizens are kind of the, the and on the other, other hand the non-binary transgender people with non-binary identities and gender variant people who have a total different citizenship status. So it's <coughs> Norway is very binary um, oriented in that respect. So in, in order to understand this um, Norwegian trans policy, I, I find uh, Dr. Um, Nancy Fraser's, political scientist Nancy Fraser's conceptual toolkit with recognition, representation and distribution um, a very um, handy to, to use. Where, <coughs> where uh, Fraser maintains that in order to, to assure distribution and redistribution, and in this case we are talking about redistribution of citizenship rights and uh, health care rights. In order to get this distribution and redistributions, um, people need to be, <coughs> and groups and needs and concerns and interests need to be recognized and need to, act, to get access to the political arena to, to get uh, representation here to, uh, to be able to, to change um, their policy deliberations. Uh, the flow is, is going different ways, so that's why I have arrows the other ways as well. Once groups and the minorities have gotten re representation, they also can um, bring about recognition of other groups and other needs. Or they can um, stop recognition in some ways. So, <clears throat> so understanding the Norwegian policy is looking at what kind of uh, recognitions, uh, what forms of recognition are important here. And the one, <clears throat> of course, is recognition of trans persons as equal citizens. And then we're talking about trans persons, both the, the um, uh, gender corrected women and men, but also the non-binary, the gender variant, the, the gender fluid uh, people, uh, individuals. Uh, and another important form of recognition is the recognition of allies who are <coughs> our allies in the political system, who are those who have already representation and who are our non-allies. Uh, there are groups, uh, specifically the gender corrected women and men, <coughs> who have representation in the political system who are not allies at all when it comes to non-binary interests and gender fluid people. So, so we have to recognize also the non-allies. And then the recognition of oh, it's a, I forgot this one. The recognition of other experts in the, in the trans policy making processes, <coughs> uh, ensuring representation of other knowledges than only the medical profession, which in the beginning or still it has a very um, large position and a gatekeeping position for other medical experts and for other experts or other um, uh, discourses. So. In order to understand, <coughs> we have to, the, to look at this recognition, to, to understand the legal victories. We have the, the, in Norway very interesting legal victories, but <coughs> and I will say more about that. And unfortunately, medical defeats due to the mal recognition of trans and gender non-conforming issues on people and due to the non-recognition of other medical doctors. So, so I think it is important to, to discuss more the recognition of what. <coughs> Where I think the recognition of differences, and not only differences between the majority, the, the cis, uh, hetero, sexual majority, but also differences within minorities. Specifically, in Norway, the differences between the 
those who consider themselves as gender corrected uh, women and men and the growing um, group of uh, gender fluid, gender diverse and gender non-binary um, individuals and groups. So to, uh, uh, recognizing the majority within the minority is an, is an important um, uh, issue. <coughs> Uh, in order to see the recognition of unjust differences due to malrecognition and due to discrimination, also discrimination of access to healthcare. Another form of, this, uh, of recognition is the recognition, as I said, of allies. It took a while before the LGB organizations were willing to, um, to include the T in their uh, issues because they were afraid of losing their good reputation as good citizens. <clears throat> so the, do we really want to introduce trans interests? But finally they did, and I have been an important and um, uh, uh, <coughs> enthusiastic and good um, ally for the LGB, for the, the trans people, not the least for the, the gender diverse people. Amnesty International, the Norwegian uh, chapter, it became also a very um, strong ally when talking about uh, legal gender legislation. Uh, the recognition of other experts and discourses, once other medical uh, uh, science and social sciences were introduced, citizenship issues and citizenship discourses and human rights discourses got a space in the uh, political uh, discussions, which, so it, which um, contributed to the, um, destabilizing the um, the um, monopoly of the gender identity clinic, which I come to now. <clears throat> because earlier uh, in the Norwegian system, the representation of interests and, and experts were in some kind of medical administrative uh, iron triangle, where the medical expert were the, the medical staff at the gender identity clinic, which is a monopoly in, uh, in Norway, which are, is the only um, uh, institution who, who is allowed to examine and um, uh, treat uh, uh, gender uh, for gender um, uh, incongruency. And they are, are uh, very um, gatekeeping with regard to who is, who is sufficiently trans, quote unquote, to be allowed um, um, treatment. And the interest group who, who uh, supports the gender identity clinic is earlier patients of the, the clinic and the, those who see themselves as gender corrected women and men. So this, this small <coughs> system, and in Norway the corporate system uh, makes that experts and interest groups are important in policy formation. They decided <coughs> they, uh, on, on the policies in Norway. So the, the recognition of new groups and the recognition of other experts brought about new um, policy um, in, in Norway so, in, and the institutionalization of, of other groups in, in the political system was very important for the uh, success, successes of um, uh, in Norway. The successes which were in 2014, got anti-discrimination legislation uh, based on gender, so protection against discrimination based on gender identity and or uh, gender expression, which came very late. Earlier, it had been very <coughs> regular that people, trans people, lost their jobs when they trans, uh, transitioned. Uh, in 2016, we got the Legal Gender Recognition Act. And that was that meant also the end of forced sterilization and the end of diagnosis. So the gender identity clinic lost some of its um, monopoly since they were not <coughs> not the gatekeepers anymore for changing your gender. And from the age of 16, everybody who wants can change their gender. And um, from um, 12 to 16, you have to have the permission of one of your parents or you have to, to change your gender. And parents can, can legally change the, the gender of their kids from the age of six, so that a trans child can start at school in the, in the gender that uh, is... Okay, yeah. 
That is good, and that, that uh, is um, how she identifies, she or he or him. Unfortunately, the, the, uh, the Legal Gender Recognition Act only gives two boxes still. They have the, 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 non, the non binary are not, <coughs> do not have a box, not have an alternative. But th th there is um, in the parliament, uh, they're working on it now to have a third, uh, not a third gender, but a third alternative. So, so we had, <coughs> Norway has been successful in the legal. Um, uh, part and the medical legal uh, monopoly has been this, um, um, the constructed, but in, with regard to to the medical part, the recognition of of um, the, the more recognition of um, health needs of trans and gender non-confirming patients is still still um, still there, and what we see now that the new um, uh, directors in the in the gender identity clinic, which is still the, the, the um, uh, monopoly, are talking about the nation's daughters when they when they uh, and are concerned about the so-called trendy trendy uh, <coughs> development among young uh, adolescents, adolescents who are assigned female. So it's just, and they, they so they went out in the papers and said now the the Minister of Health has to be take care of our nation's daughters because we are losing in fertility. Well, three years ago they were still sterilizing all trans people. So this, <coughs> so and and the the, the 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 discourse of the the rapid onset gender uh, dysphoria is is very popular in the, in the gender identity clinic, unfortunately. Uh, the, they, they can also continue to, to be gatekeeping towards other doctors, since they are, are the only ones who have the authority to, to provide uh, uh, financial, uh, funded, uh, uh, publicly funded health care. And in a, in a new committee, uh, the, who is uh, um, uh, in, in the Ministry of Health, the, a new committee is is less um, open to to other um, uh, knowledge. So, so sexologists are not invited anymore, and and trans friendly psychologists are silenced, unfortunately. So so we are in a way going seemingly going back to this iron triangle when it comes to medical questions, to health questions. Yep. Which which. Um, so this, this non-recognition and mal recognition leads to non-representation and leads to non-redistribution of healthcare. So it looks it looks bad. So are we back to the start? Are we back to the strengthening of the medical gatekeeping institution, the gender identity clinic? Uh, as in other countries, the TERFs are, are under a very um, High, high voices and are contact, contesting the legal gender recognition, of course, because without corrective surgery, because they're very uh, afraid of penises in the, in the bathrooms, as if people do have to change the legal gender to go to the to a women's bathroom. So, <clears throat> and the new medical staff, as I said, is contesting the young trans man hearing those so-called trends. But on the other hand, we also see, to, to end a slightly positive, on a slightly positive note, we, we now see a legal action against the state where the, um, they are suing the state for uh, the earlier obligatory sterilization, which they say was not, not a consensual intervention. A lot of uh, uh, people, a lot of individuals changed <coughs> or were sterilized, not because that it was uh, informed consent, but, but because that was the only way to change the legal gender, and now they're saying, "Hey, this was this was not cons consensual." So, in Sweden, they they already have <coughs> been successful, and we hope in they are Norway too that the state will uh, will have to see that they <coughs> that was a, a human right breach. 
And what we have seen specifically now, we have very many parades, pride parades this year. I think every little city is parading now, which is nice. And trans uh, are, are participating in these parades, in large numbers and in many parades. So, so the trans visibility is increasing. So I do hope, or I do still think, um, and we are positive, but the, the non-recognition and mal-recognition has to be taken care of. Thank you.